Hi everyone. Today I'd like to ask a question about whether or not photography can really be creative. Now the obvious answer is yes, but I would guess that most people don't ever really contemplate what it means to be creative. Better yet, how to make creative photographs. <laughs> The reason I think this question about photography being creative is a really important one is because we all do photography. Photography is not about uh, expensive gear anymore and in fact it hasn't been for a long time. Going all the way back to 1897, Alfred Stieglitz said it was undoubtedly due to the hand camera that photography became so generally popular a few years ago. Every Tom, Dick and Harry could without trouble learn how to get something or other on a sensitive plate. And this is what the public wanted. No work and lots of fun. Each when an enterprising firm flooded the market with a very ingenious hand camera and the announcement, you push the button, we do the rest. And so really what's interesting about this advertising uh, for Kodak Brownie camera is that that was the moment that photography became separated from the technical to the aesthetic because prior to that camera, if you wanted to do photography, you also needed to either make your own film emulsion or you had to uh, coat plates and do manual uh, photochemical processes and you had to go into a dark room and there was just a lot of technical aspects. It was very hard to get a decent uh, photograph. But with the Brownie camera, we have the same aesthetic or the same user experience of using a camera such as our smartphone. And in fact, when I pull up my smartphone, all I have to do is push a button and I create a photographic image. And in fact, I'll do a selfie right now. One, two, three. How hard was that? The technical quality of photography is very, very simple. Now, I'm not dis dismissing technical skill necessary uh, to do great photography, but what I'm saying is to create a photographic image, all you have to do is push the button, right? So I think it's worth revisiting this question about what is creative photography, what is creativity? Especially when you consider how many photographs are being uploaded to the internet day after day after day, uh, whether it's Facebook or Instagram. This is an ad several years ago from Instagram that talked about how uh, within 37 minutes you would have a stack of photographic prints that would reach beyond the Empire State Building and the end of 12 hours you would have a stack of, think about how flat these photos are, all the way up uh, above Mount Everest and when we think about all the images that we see on a daily basis, we're bombarded with upwards of 10,000 visual images per day, uh, they start looking the same, right? And so here are a sunset uh, series of photos that I looked up that are really about photography reproducing a phenomenon. And so pointing a camera to sunset by itself, I don't think constitutes a creative act. And in fact, uh, this was a major astrological event. There was a to total solar eclipse back in 2016 or 2017. I know that I uh, drove down to Oregon and I got to see uh, the eclipse and photograph it through my friend's uh, telescope. And the reality is my photographs looked like all the other millions of photographs of that same event. If you travel internationally, guess what? You're likely making images from the exact same spot that other tourists make them. And in fact, if you go uh, driving down the highway, you will see those blue scenic uh, viewpoint signs that tell you, hey, pull over, take a photo. And so again, I'm going to challenge us, is this really creativity? The selfie, and again, I just made one. Uh, is another common photograph, extremely common these days, and it's reproducing a phenomena. It's reproducing a, a physical world at, into a photographic image, but I'd like us to explore how we can put more into those images. So let's talk about what is creativity. Uh, from a human perspective, creativity has three different levels. 
the first level would be creatio ex nihilo, which simply means uh, it's Latin for creation from nothing. And uh, this image that I photographed on water showing the, the sun starburst uh, being broken into a bunch of specular highlights on the water is the closest I could come to express that idea of the divine, the universe, the creation uh, from nothing. And the reality is, is that is beyond our human capabilities. Well, I can't even comprehend it, really, to be honest with you. It's this idea of where is the origin of the universe? Uh, the other term that is often used is this creatio ex Deo, uh, which is the creation from the gods, uh, Deo being God. And, and really, a lot of creative people describe the experience of creativity as being like a divine inspiration. In fact, writers talk about the, the muses, that the story tells itself. The artist will talk about the painting made itself. And we have a lot in our culture that alludes to this idea that creativity comes from somewhere else and it is a gift that is bestowed upon us. But that tends to leave most of us from the perspective of, oh, if I don't feel like I have talent, can I be creative? If I don't have that spiritual awakening or that God's gift in a, in a finger touch, uh, thinking about the Sistine Chapel at that particular moment, um, what can I do to be creative? And I love this work by Andy Goldsworthy because he expresses the true creativity that we all have access to, which is the creatio ex materia which is the idea that creativity comes through the rearrangement of existing elements into new combinations. And this is the domain of human creativity. And I have a couple of images here. This is an image of Andy Goldsworthy. Uh, there's a great film uh, documentary about his work called Rivers and Tides. And he works with just found natural material and puts it together in interesting combinations. Here's some more of his work where he's simply gathering rocks or he's gathering leaves of a single color and putting them together to create impact and using design elements to really create these phenomenal images. And by the way, that's the first thing we can do as photographers to make creative work is to uh, gather the special images that we make and put them into a portfolio so that we can really share the highlights of, of the best of our creativity. So if creation is about rearranging existing elements, where does my creativity come from? Well, your creativity and my creativity is defined as being a synthesis of originality and spontaneity. And really, our originality is about our frequency and intensity of life experiences. And so your originality comes from your life, your experiences. Nietzsche says that you should go out and live uh, dangerously. Well, I think what he was really saying is he wasn't saying put yourself at, at uh, extreme risk, but he was saying go live out an interesting life. Creative people generally do interesting things and have interesting experiences. They go out and experience it. The other part of it, though, is the spontaneity. And, and what we're talking about with spontaneity is technical mastery. It's mastering the camera, the equipment, the computer software, the lighting gear, the metering, uh, the film. If you're working on the film, whatever the film process is, you're mastering it to the point where you don't have to consciously think about it. I want you to think about it for a moment. When you first picked up a camera, particularly one that had manual exposure control, when you were trying to just get that first exposure of lining up the meter and, and aperture and the shutter speed, you aren't thinking about what you're actually looking at. You're thinking about the technical uh, facets of recording an image. And th that's really uh, the issue that we have is we have to get beyond the technical to get to the intuitive, the spontaneous. And so really, ultimately, creativity is about arranging elements to transmit ideas that evoke spirit. So what we're really talking about here is this idea that a camera, especially today's camera, uh, will, with a push of a button, make a perfect recording, an image likeness of the world we live in. And so it's really a photocopy machine in the hands of a novice. But in order to move beyond simple reproduction, 
we need to synthesize our life experiences and our technical skills, and we need to arrange these elements in a way that transmits ideas that evoke spirit. Another way of putting this is to be creative in the making of photographs. I want to transmit emotions into the work that I'm making. In order for us to understand how we can be creative with photography, we have to first define the problem. We have to understand the limitations of the medium of photography and understand the difference between the medium of photography and other art forms. And so one of the problems for photography is that we don't have a blank canvas. You know, the first mark on a canvas is the first evidence of the emotion and the idea of the artist that is painting that canvas. We don't have that. We are starting with a subject that exists in the world and we're recording it. Uh, and so we have that technology of reproduction. Also, as I've demonstrated already, photography requires limited cognitive requirements. I don't have to think. I can just push the button. I can put the camera on auto exposure. Uh, and, and I really don't have to put a lot of thought into making images. On top of that, we live in the world of Instagram, Facebook, social media of all kinds, Twitter. And what's happening is we are becoming accustomed to trying to please our audience that gives us our likes or our dislikes. And so uh, when we make images, we are actually getting a Pavlovian response of what kinds of images do people love and I make that. And the reality is great creative work is rarely liked by very many people. And in fact, just this morning I was listening to a podcast and I was listening to a really uh, successful artist talk about that uh, really 80% of the people that see his work walk on by. It's that 20% that say, wow, that's amazing. I have to have one of those. Uh, and so it's that 80-20 rule uh, all over again, Pareto's principle. But the reality is when we look at the history of creativity, virtually every revolutionary creative idea was at first rejected because there was always a fear of the new and the unknown. Here's three examples of that. Uh, the fear of the new and the unknown, these UFOs, if you will. Uh, the image on the left is a painting by Claude Monet mm -hmm. that was resoundingly rejected at first. In fact, he was part of the first exhibition of Impressionist painters. And those Impressionists were the ones that were rejected uh, by the Academy of uh, Arts in, in France, that they were, they were outcast and they held their own show. But the reality is what they were doing was fleeing the world of realism because they said photography already has that. And instead of doing realism, they wanted to do something they felt was more emotive. And so they were doing more expressionistic and giving us an impression through color and light and value. Uh, and so Monet and the Impressionists were not uh, liked very well. They were roundly criticized. The image in the middle is uh, Robert Rauschenberg's work where he took a stuffed goat and combined it with a tire and combined it with some other found objects and painted on it. Um, put some toothpaste on it, as I recall, and put it in a gallery. And people just really criticized Rauschenberg's work. Uh, and he came up with this new idea of combinations, combines. Uh, and, and that's one of the interesting things is it takes a while to understand because when you're doing something truly new, there's no bridge behind it to connect it to the past. Uh, and so you have to form a language that connects and bridges to the past a little bit. Uh, the image on the right is one of my favorites. I had an opportunity to see an exhibit of Calder's work. This is Alexander Calder's, one of his earliest moving art pieces. We all know this is uh, a mobile now. These are commonly found uh, hanging above cribs of babies. They're fascinating to look at. They move through gravity. Uh, and yet this work was not accepted early on. Now I want to talk about why creativity is so difficult, even though the technology is so simple. Creativity is one of the highest levels of thinking, uh, and it's a skill that can be acquired, it can be learned. And when we look at creativity, uh, we look at the levels of cognition, 
Uh, and so we start at simply remembering and recognizing and recalling. And this is where one of the first ways we can improve our photography is by looking at a lot of art and a lot of design. And we remember combinations and sequences and we remember uh, organizations that provide a structure that makes sense. Uh, also, I will tell you that most photographs that I make, if it's a, a social documentary, is really a reference back or what's caught my eye and triggered me to want to pick up that camera is a memory. And I'll give you some examples of that as we go along. And so once we get past the remembering stage, we work our way up to understanding. We understand the medium. We understand the tools. We understand design elements and principles. And then we get up to being able to apply that, being able to go out and make something. And creativity is about making an image, not taking an image. Uh, and then after we've made the image, we go through the editing process and the ability to analyze and to evaluate. And then we come back and refine and we do different iterations. And then we build the skill level to where we can truly create fluidly, intuitively, and, it, and uh, we talk about it later about getting into a flow state where the creativity just happens and you can turn it on or off by simply entering into a state of consciousness that allows you to tap in to the creativity that you have learned over an extended period of time. And in fact, one of the interesting things about photography and about visual literacy is that it is very much like learning to read. It's got a lot of linguistic qualities and we really, it does take a long time to learn. So here we look at the exposure triangle and you see that, you know, just looking at this graphic and understanding, uh, you know, and I'm using the language of, of the uh, uh, Bloom's taxonomy of levels of cognition right there, to understand the relationship of aperture, ISO, and shutter speed and how those things affect the aesthetic of a photographic image requires a high level of uh, creative thinking. We can actually map the act of making a photograph to these levels of cognition. The first step is I see something. And in fact, I will say that I start out hearing something or feeling something, but then I turn and I look and I see something and I recognize, I recall, and I go, yes, this is important. I want to point my camera at this subject and make a photograph. The second level is I need to analyze the lighting conditions and to evaluate what exposure is going to give me the proper exposure to create the image that I have pre-visualized in my mind. And then I have to raise the camera up and I need to compose the image and arrange it within that framework of the uh, sensor or the film plane. And then finally, I over time, I start to develop a unique style that is recognizable. And the only way we do that is through that 10,000 uh, 10, hour rule that just says you do something over and over, you get pretty good at it and you start to develop a style. So this is our pathway towards becoming more creative. This is kind of the pyramid approach of recognizing that creativity starts at the base. Our foundation base is good technical skills. And that's why a lot of photographic workshops and classes really focus on building skill. And then we move beyond that to start developing some concepts and start experimenting with some themes and some genres. And then ultimately over time, we be able to, uh, we're able to move into a pure creative mode uh, that allows us to play. And really, Picasso said to be creative is to remain a child. And it's that childlike wonder that we bring to our work. In my now over 30 years of photography, I have distilled it down to six basic strategies that I think can lead us towards making creative photographs. And I'm going to start with the first one, not the most obvious one, but the first one, which is sequencing multiple images. And let's just take a look at that. I'll, I'll point out uh, why this is my first strategy. And here's an example of two photographs that I've made. One was taken on a island in the San Juans, and the other was taken in uh, downtown Manhattan, New York. And you can see the connection between the white picket fence, and you can see the connection to the white lines painted in the crosswalk that the elderly man with the briefcase is walking through that. Now, 
remembering this idea of recall, when I saw the man with the slightly hunched shoulders and the, and the hat and the briefcase walk across that, I was instantly reminded of my grandfather who used to go and do door-to-door -door sales carrying a big bag of uh, tracks and brochures and that sort of thing. And so I didn't have to think very much. I just instantly, because I had so much technical background, didn't have to think about focus, didn't have to think about exposure, but I instantly made that image and I found it very satisfying uh, because it ultimately had a really strong composition and it had a strong memory for me. And then when I go back and I review my work and here's this other image from the San Juan Islands and I go, oh, you see a pattern to my seeing. And really a creativity when it comes to sequencing images is about revealing the maker of the image through the similarities, the patterns that emerge organically, uh, intuitively in our work. Now, here's a couple of images, and this is actually from a series taken on my cell phone. I, I take photographs every single day with my cell phone. It's always on me, and I make a, it's my visual journal. And so the reason I start with our first strategy being about sequencing photographs is because really an awful lot of times we start out simply pointing and shooting. What I mean by point and shoot is that we tend to put the subject in the middle of the frame, and we don't really pay attention to the frame and we just point and click and yet if you go back and review all those images that you've made on your cell phone or with your camera and you start building interesting rearrangement of relationships now you start to reveal the maker Here's some photojournalism by Ed Cashy, and photojournalists use sequencing to tell visual stories all the time. That's a photojournalistic storytelling, whereas the uh, sequence before was a little more abstract, a little more just conveying an a, a ephemeral, uh, what I call an ineffable experience, an emotional feeling that doesn't have a particular concise meaning, whereas photojournalism gets a little bit more concise. And I will tell you that photojournalism is perfect perhaps uh, one of the most creative forms of photography there is candid photography maximizes the technology of, of photography to its highest peak uh, compared to any other uh, form. But I'll save that for another uh, lecture sometime down the road. Uh, some would argue that, that photojournalism is the last modernist art form left uh, from the 20th century. That same uh, idea of sequencing plays out in cinematography. So if you're making videos, guess what? It is the sequencing of your shots that tell a story. And so here's a cl uh, clip that we'll take a look at. So using nothing but photographic imagery, moving images, and changing composition, changing camera angle, this filmmaker is telling a story and, and really translating some tense emotions in that sequence. So uh, this is why sequencing is such my number one strategy for expressing ourselves creatively with photography. The second strategy that I think really allows us to express our creativity is through formal composition. And so looking at these three images, you'll see kind of a spectrum here. Uh, you'll notice the image on the left is a very well-known uh, painting by Picasso that was part of Cubism. And really what Cubism was about, and this really helped photography, by the way, what Cubism was about was trying to go where photography couldn't go by representing a simplification of form, a simplification of shape, and being able to also portray multiple viewpoints in the same two-dimensional plane. And so where the camera was seen as having a fixed perspective and was stuck within the realm of realism, uh, cubism began that emergence into a more expressive, a more abstraction, a more design-oriented uh, image. And really, an image at its foundation is 
the design elements, line, shape, form, texture, etc. And so we go from Picasso to uh, an artist that I really love. His name's Dan Price. He's a really interesting guy uh, who did photography and drawings. And he makes these very simple drawings and paintings. And he's managed to make a, a great life doing what he loves. And then simplifying it even further, I'm expressing this design... Um, I'm expressing this design concept called Notan, which is similar to chiaroscuro, but a little more intense. This Notan is the, the light and dark values, uh, and it's a Japanese uh, design term that has been really important in my own personal work. In fact, here's an image that I made that was inspired by these concepts of simplified shapes in, in, in really deep black and white no tan values. This is the Spokane Riverfront Park clock tower and this is the image I made and to do that I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning and get downtown before anyone else was there and see the sun peek through the little window opening. It looks like a lighthouse, right? Well, guess what? This is my way of creating an image and if you do a search for that clock tower, because it's a well-known landmark, this is what you find when you do an internet search. And so I think what I'm illustrating is it just takes a little bit of, uh, more effort to create something as opposed to record it. Here's some more of my uh, uh, artwork uh, based on this idea of no tan. These are some really, this part of a collection of, of work I did a couple years ago. And so when we talk about composition, we're really breaking things down to the minimal shapes, uh, the minimal, the, the lines, the form. We're breaking it down into simple uh, elements within that frame. And we need to be able to see the world graphically. So if I go back here for a moment, to be a better photographer, I need to not see all the details, but rather start paying attention to the arrangement of the shapes, the patterns. Uh, and this is why, uh, and this is what lets me get to this with my compositions. So we're going to spend a lot of time next week talking about elements and principles of design. So don't worry about what we've got more coming there. But I just want to give you the idea that we have to pay attention to this to make more creative photographs. Uh, Paul Strand is credited with demonstrating that photography really was an art form because it could illustrate strong design. And he did this both in detail, abstract detail shots that emphasize the geometry, the shapes, and the, and the light and dark values. But he also was able to demonstrate it in wider scenes, uh, such as these uh, uh, people walking towards the New York Stock Exchange uh, back in the 30s. So uh, Paul Strand is credited with helping move photographic thinking towards formal design elements and principles. Uh, Cartier-Bresson took it to a whole nother level because whereas Paul Strand was using large format cameras, 8x10 cameras on tripods, uh, he did some handheld large format too, but not the candid level quite like Henri Cartier-Bresson, whose decisive moment, by the way, gets uh, oftentimes misinterpreted as being the peak emotion. No, what he was talking about was the peak geometry of composition, the line, the form, the shape, etc. And so to imagine that he was capturing these images super fast, candid. There's a person running, there's a person riding a bike, and yet they are so structurally sound in their composition. Uh, to me, makes him my uh, probably the most profound photographer of the 20th century to be able to do that. Uh, there's a famous photographer, uh, Mark Reboud, uh, and I'm probably butchering the last name, forgive me, but he basically says that uh, photography is about savoring life at a hundredth of a second. And here we see the formal design and the movement within this image by Henri Cartier-Bresson. I really like this quote by Francis Ruggieri, who says, The application of design to the photograph is entirely in the hands of the photographer. It means that he must be equipped technically and aesthetically. The photographer ultimately will have to be trained with as much care as those who practice the other arts. And you see that with these images, and I like to point out these are not Photoshop. These are darkroom made prints, handmade prints, uh, that show the ability to make a well-composed, well-designed image using a camera. 
I like to share this quote by Plato that basically says, the experiences that do not provoke thought are those that do not at the same time issue a contradictory perception. Those that do have the effect that I set down as provocative when the perception no more manifests one thing than its contrary, alike whether its impact comes from nearby or, or afar. What Plato is expressing all those many, many centuries ago was the idea that the image, the single image that is the strongest composition is one that has a juxtaposition of difference, of binary opposites, that that tension, that contrast visually creates a dynamic image. And so juxtaposition is a tool that we use within formal composition. We start looking for abstract lines, shapes, forms, pattern, uh, etc. But then we move towards how do I say the most within a single frame? And we do that with juxtaposition. Here we see this image on the left by Willie Ronis uh, that is an interesting, to me interesting, showing a sculpture of an angel that is bowing down uh, in front of the newly built radio tower, the Eiffel Tower. And it's almost like the age of religion is bowing to the age of science. Uh, and it's got that symbolic quality to it, not to mention the dark and light values, the positive and negative aspects to it. The photo on the right is now categorized uh, in contemporary terms of being minimalist photography by Michael Kenna, who is simplifying the design of his image by simply having a long time exposure so that those things that are moving get blurred and smoothed out, moved away, and you get the simple graphic of these shoji gate uh, against the contrast of the moving clouds in the sky and the smooth surface of water. And so you get this juxtaposition of stillness and movement, uh, and it makes for a dynamic image. The next category of creativity is where many photographers actually try to start out, and that is learning the craft and the technique. And nobody is better known for craft and technique than Ansel Adams, who he, along with Minor White and some others, developed the zone system. And what he was doing was taking his experience as a pianist and applying it to making musical tones, if you will, in the printing of a photographic image. And he came up with a scale that he could move the exposure and development times uh, up and down that scale to create an emotional impact. And in fact, he was quoted as saying that uh, he doesn't like to use words because it doesn't really express the deeper meaning. And, and, and I'll bring that quote to you at a later date. But basically, he used tones like a pianist would use chords in a music uh, composition to evoke that emotion, that spirit that we talked about earlier. Here's an example of some work that I did with a colleague of mine, Dr. Greg Roth, where we were experimenting with wet plate collodion uh, photography, where we were photographing people in the 21st century using a process from the 19th century. This is a photochemical process of the 1870s. And on top of that, we were experimenting with using flash photography and uh, discovering that we needed uh, about 8,000 watt seconds of light to be able to record and exposure. Uh, so that was very much technique driven. Uh, one of my colleagues, I really love her work, Melissa Rackham, one of the most phenomenal artists I know, uh, incorporates a little craft and technique into using cyanotypes that she's connecting multiple images together by actually gluing on a piece of string to create this relationship. She's combining sequence and uh, collage, if you will, to uh, bring the craft of image making. And some of the uh, images form through hand-drawn negatives. Uh, I believe the dog was hand-drawn. And so when you see her imagery, she's using a photochemical process, a cyanotype, but she's capturing, again, going back to recall, the wonder of childhood and expressing that through her creative works. This is a couple of my photographs. Uh, they're uh, still life, and the other image is an image of a uh, Christmas tree floating out in the lake in New Jersey that I took on film and then uh, combined with a couple other exposures. Uh, and so this could fit in a couple different creative categories, but really this was part of a process of platinum printing. 
And I made this video to be able to show people what I go through to make one image. First, I'm working in my studio, setting up a still life, and then I'm going to be uh, editing that. It's a digital image, I'm editing it, and then I'm gonna print out a test print, and then I'm gonna make a negative from that, and then I'm gonna go into the dark room, and I'm gonna count out specific number of drops of platinum and palladium. And the platinum, uh, at the time I was making this, was running about $800 an, or $1,800 an ounce, and the palladium was about $900 an ounce. I could be reversed, but I mean, it's really expensive stuff, so you're doing it by drop by drop. And then I'm brushing it onto the surface of my paper to let it become photosensitive, letting it dry. It's not, uh, it's not sensitive to uh, indoor tungsten lights. It's only sensitive to UV light. And so I'm letting it dry and I'm getting my negative that I made uh, and putting that into a contact printing frame. And then I put the negative over that sensitized paper, fasten it down so it doesn't move so I can flip it over towards the glass side. An old contact frame and then I'm exposing it for 20 minutes under UV light that I made this UV light box out of uh, UV fluorescent tubes while that's being exposed and mixing up the developer and the fixer for this print and there's the developer And you can see the latent image uh, appear where it's been exposed, but then the development is instant. Just real, all of a sudden, I didn't do a very good job on getting it even on there, so I had to uh, finish up rocking the tray to get it on there. Uh, but that's, the, that's a platinum printing process where it takes me over an hour to make one print. All right, the next category of creative approaches I like to use is still life photography, because really that is the taking of existing elements and arranging them. And in this case, I'm arranging them with the idea of there's some storytelling component. You don't know what the story is, but you get a sense of it and allows your imagination to wander a little bit within these images. Uh, so gathering elements together and photographing them is a creative act because you're pulling things that don't exist by themselves uh, and you're putting that story together. Truly the, the finest master of this technique that I personally know is my colleague Eric Soner. He's just a master of light and still life and creativity uh, that just is phenomenal work. The next category is tableau photography and that's simply what I consider make-believe. That is me getting people together, getting costumes. You remember what it was like to be a kid? Uh, when my son was young, we had this treasure chest of uh, costumes that he would dress up every day and be a, a new superhero. He'd have other kids over, they'd dress up and play. Well, we can do that as photographers. And so this is kind of a steampunk meets Western meets uh, Las Vegas sort of thing of I just brought these eight people together. We uh, had a, a wardrobe to choose from, and I said, here, you put this on, here, you bring this, and, and let's just get together. And we spent about three hours making this one image, and, uh, and it was shot in camera, and then I ultimately combined what I thought were the best expressions uh, in, the, in the frame. And you can actually see the poker chips throwing, uh, flying in the air, and I'm able to capture that with flash photography. So uh, tablet is this idea of I'm creating a narrative, I'm telling a dramatic story, but it's made up, it's make-believe, and it didn't exist. And creativity is about bringing something together that didn't exist before that. And so I love tableau photography for that. A uh, technique that I really love is the ability to create composites and collages and montages. And here is a sequence that shows you the raw image 
being put together into a composite image. I photographed a performance of Oban dancers that were at a uh, public space. It's really a snapshot, if you will, of just this uh, young dancer. And then I combined it with a bridge that I photographed in Hawaii that really fit the, uh, uh, the image I was going for to really appreciate the Chinese, Japanese gardens uh, experience. And so that combined with some texturing was able to create this image. And I think composite imagery allows me to come the closest to painting uh, that there is, that I can start with a blank canvas and mix and match my elements together. So I want to go back to this image here with the eclipse and uh, show you that you can bring creativity to these events like this. In my case, I actually made a composite image that actually combined two photographs made at the same event the same day. And the first photograph was of a bluebird on a juniper bush that I had photographed right before the event happened. And I layered that in with the, uh, the solar eclipse. And I had such an experience of awe. That's the name of this image is awe. Uh, I had such an awe-inspiring experience that I realized that I, in the big cosmic scheme of things, I was no more significant than that little bluebird, that this event made me feel a little more equal to this small little bird. And then I took it a step further. About a year later, I had an opportunity to work with a couple of models in my studio and added to the structure of the narrative to really express that original feeling, that originality part of showing the human figures and the bird together in awe uh, to this wondrous cosmic event. So that's where I took it with my creativity. So there you have it, six strategies to bring more creativity into your photographic imagery. With that, I hope to have inspired you to start thinking about how can I bring my originality, how can I develop my spontaneity, and how can I bring that together to make creative photographs. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you next time.